One, two, three. 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 Just replaced it now. So I hope I'm, I'm not to forget what I got to admit that uh, mine's not. Uh, no, I just completely misunderstood the, the theme because uh, digital futures was started to dream about future in any form, not in media. This morning I read the text. Oh, I can't see it. Well, I was just to um, tell us what you're doing. So that's what that's what mine is. Never mind. How do I pronounce your surname? Mine? Albegain. Albegain. Khalid Albegain. Khalid Albegain. I'll get it wrong now. Yeah, don't worry. I get my own name wrong. <laughs> well, welcome back, everyone. Um, I trust you've had a busy, busy lunchtime. 
uh, just seeing what's on view here and talking and things. I think, uh, you know, one of the, the great uh, advantages of all being together in this, uh, in this place today with different things on is that I think we're finding ourselves inspired in one way and then we talk to someone else and we're inspired in another way and then we move through and then we go to the tech fair and that's going to continue all afternoon and in fact all week. So uh, welcome back. Uh, we enjoyed I think uh, the Lions app. Quite a few of us have been uh, texting people saying have you seen that Lions app? Well I have anyway to my son who presumably will be sitting in lessons now getting into trouble for having a look at that. Uh, we're going to continue looking at apps and uh, how they're going to develop and the way forward for apps. Uh, Hugh is our chair for this session again. And uh, Hugh, I'll let you to welcome your guests. Um, I so enjoyed the one this morning. They invited me back to carry on. So I'm very glad of that. Um, session promo with the Never in Bach. This afternoon session has changed a little bit slightly. We have an additional guest at the end of the table. Um, so we're going to start off, uh, we're talking about apps basically, so is there a need for an app? Because uh, there's one of those things where people talk about, oh we need an app for this. And I think one of the questions that we sometimes don't often ask ourselves enough is, do we actually need an app for this? Felly, dwi'n mynd i gofyn wrth Anton Falk Cymryd i ddod yma yn siarad y gyntaf. Anton will speak first. Um, Professor Khalid Albagain. Well Almost. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be next. <laughs> I went in. My Gwyn Roberts, well, whether you mean of any, Gwyn Roberts has joined us, who will be talking just briefly about funds that are available uh, via the Digital Development Fund. Um, so if you've got any ideas for apps out there, um, the money that can be made for them. Uh, Anton Falk, just go for that. Thank you very much, Hugh. Thank you very much, Hugh. Thank you very It was great to get a round of applause before you even started. Um, uh, yeah, thanks very much. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, if my slides could, yeah, it's lovely. Um, so my name's Anton Falkenbridge uh, from Rant Media. I uh, want to just uh, quickly uh, give you a brief overview about us. Uh, we just do mobile apps uh, and games. Uh, we got into that quite early, uh, sort of <coughs> mid-2008. Uh, and we've done quite a bit of stuff since that time for uh, various national and international brands. Uh, and we've got our own sort of games brand as well. Uh, because uh, one of the things I was asked to do was uh, talk about what we've been up to. Uh, I've got a little showreel, which uh, if we kick that off. I hope there's sound. No sound. Oh.
me back in the room. Um, the title for this session is, uh, is there an app for that? Um, and I think that the reality is that's definitely not the case as, as Hugh alluded to. Not every app is a, a good idea. I've got some really good examples of that. Um, this is from uh, British Farmer and Grower. So they put out a, a, an article on some really good ideas that uh, people have had for apps. I don't know if you can read that, but uh, first one is an anti-rustling app uh, linked to a central camera located on a pole in the livestock field. The infrared camera identifies each animal by their heat signature, uh, heat signal, sorry, uh, and it sends push alerts to the farmer's phone if the number of heat signals decreases. Um, I just have this vision of two sort of cows in a field going past each other, the number going down by one, and the farmer getting a, a sort of a push notification at four in the morning or something. Uh, and the next one, this sort of health and safety app, employees would install this location-aware app, which presumably would work indoors as well. Uh, so when they use dangerous equipment, how it knows that you're using dangerous equipment, I don't know. Uh, it lets them know if they are trained to use it. Well, presumably, you would know if you were trained to use it. Um, in an emergency, how do we know it's an emergency? The app can shut down the equipment and call the emergency services with voice control. Uh, that is not a good idea. <laughs> um, not every app is technically possible. Um, some uh, good examples of that that, that we've had, uh, we've had people saying, uh, we'd like you to uh, build an app where uh, I can take a photo of a tire and it'll tell me what the pressure is uh, on your car, which sounds like a great idea, but uh, is, is not technically possible at the moment. Uh, or, uh, you know, I pick anything. Uh, there, there are so many uh, uh, pointless, technically impossible uh, apps out there. So you have to be careful on uh, sort of doing a sanity check on, on, on what you're talking about. Uh, not every app will make money. If the, if the objective of, of the app is to sort of uh, bring in a revenue stream, uh, it can be quite difficult to do that. Um, you'll find when you're talking to people that everybody thinks that their idea is absolutely uh, amazing. Um, and you have to sort of cut through that uh, personal reality distortion field. Um, it's worth just mentioning the kind of situations where an app works. So on a smart device, so at your phone, it tends to be about getting things done. So you just want, you've got a task, you've got a situation, uh, and you want to uh, achieve that. So whether that's reading the news uh, or posting to Twitter, whatever that is, uh, you want to do it as quickly as you can. Uh, on, a, on a tablet, it tends to be more content-driven, uh, so people tend to be a bit more relaxed. They might be in front of the TV, uh, generally speaking, um, and they're sort of consuming content in a meaningful way. So you need to think about the different devices. Uh, and uh, there, are, there are three main types of apps, I think. Um, you've got your sort of enterprise internal apps. Uh, you've got your brand apps. And by brand, I include sort of broadcast brands, uh, the Doctor Who's and so on. Uh, and then product-based apps. And I just want to quickly spin through uh, those different types of apps. Um, enterprise apps uh, tend to be um, used for two big purposes. One sales, uh, sales-oriented apps, and the other one is efficiency, productivity, where you provide an app uh, to an organization, uh, and it makes uh, a certain aspect of what they do more efficient or productive. Uh, these apps are great because they tend to be very results focused. So if I can make my, uh, if you're talking sales, 10% more efficient or your uh, conversion rate is 10% higher, then that has an implicit value. It's easy to measure that. You've got the pre-app, post-app. Uh, so it's easier to measure return on investment. Uh, just a quick example. Uh, we did an app for uh, Jaguar Landro, which is based around internal training. Um, and they had this issue where the, uh, the, the workforce weren't engaging with the, uh, the training material, so they spun it out on, a, uh, on an iPad, uh, very, very uh, nice and uh, tactile experience. And they ended up using that in a sales situation as well. The gesture factor uh, in presentational sales is, is really important. Uh, if you've ever seen people use uh, these smart devices and tablets, it's the swipey tappy zoomy effect uh, that really um, engages with people. Uh, I've, got, I've got an iPad somewhere if anybody wants to see them 
afterwards. Uh, brand apps are all about uh, engaging uh, with customers and prospects. Uh, so your customers, if you are uh, Doctor Who, are your viewers uh, and uh, anybody interested in that particular brand. And these apps tend to be about building uh, brand awareness, engaging with uh, that brand and creating uh, sticky customers. So by a sticky customer, I, I mean somebody who, by leaving that engagement, is going to miss out in some way. Um, the key to these kind of apps is the passonification, uh, the desire <laughs> that I have to tell you about it because it makes me look good, um, and how easy is it for me to do that? If it's something heavily sort of plug this, plug this, uh, it's not going to work. You're not going to get it passed on. Um, so we did uh, a little app for uh, Confuse.com um, that you should get because uh, they're paying for this data, right? So it, it's designed to uh, help you find the cheapest place to park, uh, and, and there's various ways that it does that. Um, but it's, it's free, and they want you to use that. Uh, and the, the branding is not sort of in your face. Uh, it's just giving you something free. Um, and uh, it makes it very, very easy to pass that on uh, because y you get to look good. The product apps uh, I would classify as those which uh, you're just trying to sell um, and uh, monetize it in various different ways. Um, as it's got at the bottom, you can uh, do sort of in-app purchases, advertising, you name it. There's sort of like a huge number of ways of doing it. It is possible to have uh, brand apps that you have monetized. Uh, there's, there's been some sort of good examples of that. Uh, it's quite a hard uh, trick to pull because you're raising your, your awareness as well as getting people to pay for that. But they come in, I mean, huge range of categories, games, uh, utilities, and uh, all kinds of things. You just uh, look on the App Store. We did a, a, an app uh, at the end of last year uh, called Vectrex, which um, was the original uh, games console from 1982, um, and that was a, sold at a premium price. So we sold that um, as an in-app purchase of uh, £4.99, uh, and uh, we managed to get uh, featured by Apple on that one, uh, which actually did help quite a lot. So I can uh, show that to you as well. I think in terms of my uh, tips for the top, uh, let me just get up to date here. Um, don't be precious about your ideas. I, I think I mentioned that earlier where uh, everybody thinks their own ideas are brilliant. Uh, and uh, so you need to be scientific about the way you evaluate your ideas. Um, you need to look at the target market um, and the size of that market uh, and how you, how you monetize it. Um, even things like platform choice, don't just choose things because you have that particular device and you really, really like it. Um, just look at who you're trying to reach and depending on who you're trying to reach, you might get a different result. It's also important to be, uh, you know, quite pragmatic about where your break-even point is. Um, can be expensive uh, to develop uh, good quality apps. Uh, so you need to make sure that uh, you've got a plan in place. Um, the features, I think, is, is a really important one. Uh, at the moment, we're being sort of bombarded with new features, new devices, uh, new capabilities. Um, but it's important to sort of distill it back to uh, what they really mean. So GPS, uh, it, which is an old old technology to an extent, uh, in, this, in the sense of smartphones it is, um, just means that I'm location aware. So as an app developer, I can give the user important insights uh, into where they are. Um, Multi-touch uh, kind of doesn't mean anything, uh, but it does mean that I can provide this very immersive and interactive experience. Uh, talk to people. So get people's opinions, uh, you know, and, and brainstorm as much as possible because it tends not to be the first idea uh, that is the one that you end up going with. Um, simplicity is really, really hard. Uh, my background is software development, and it is really, really easy to turn something uh, from a, a complex uh, original uh, process or something like that into a complex app. You just, you just uh, create what you've got already. 
The hard thing is making it simple. Uh, and if you can pull that one off, uh, then you will really increase your return on investment. Marketing channels, a lot of you guys are going to have absolutely awesome marketing channels. Uh, and I think that any place that you can uh, use as a, as a, a way of pushing out uh, details of your apps um, is, is, is vital to getting that traction uh, and uh, getting the visibility on it. Just to wrap up, I, I mean, I, I, mobile is a, a hugely growing sector at the moment, um, but it's, it's growing because of all those things up there. It's interactive, it's engaging, and it's immersive. And that's what's really turning people on. You have to focus on the user and their needs. You cannot focus on the features. You need to focus on how people are interacting and engaging with your content. Um, and I would say that quality counts. Um, unlike uh, a little while ago, perhaps, where people couldn't tell the difference between what's good and what's mediocre, people really can now. Uh, so you need to put in the effort to make it awesome. And that is me. Thank you very much. Anton. Thank you very much, Anton. Um, when I, I, I attend a lot of these uh, days in the course of my work, and I always like to take a word away with me, and I think passonification Thanks. is one of my is going to be replacing the digital landscape <laughs> as my buzzword for the future. Um, yeah, So, Professor Khalid, if you would like to take to the stand. Never mind coming question away, then we will be taking questions afterwards. Um a through There's welcome for you to contact us through Twitter. I know people are streaming. Uh, and obviously Gwyn will be talking about DDF. I can just fill in the time now just to mention about S4C's digital fund, Gron Vadi Gidoles Padrec. Magini Gronva City won't have the guest me's house, million of another blue then, Sir Juliam Prosecta Masnachol Digidol. Um it's a million pound a year fund that's been running since August. Uh, that's looking to develop commercial um, digital products. There we are, got plug in for my uh, bit. Yeah. Professor, <coughs> on with the show. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it was great to speak after uh, Anton because uh, I think he did fill the right gap before uh, my talk. Uh, I'm looking at it from different perspective a little bit. Again, what we were asked, what are you doing, and what if we need an app? So my name is Khalid El Begain, and you, you did it very well. Not many people do that. Um, I, I speak as director of CMAS. Uh, as you see, I do a lot of other things. The bigger, yes. So apps. So some people underestimate how many apps do we have in our pocket. I, when you get a, a new smartphone, basically pre-installed, you will find about 20, 30 apps already there. If you are actively engaged, after a while you will find hundreds. I counted the other day, on mine, I have about 100 apps. And the, on my iPad, probably even more, because my son uses it to play games. So he downloads all the games on the app stores. So we have lots and lots of apps, and uh, these apps are Basically, in every aspect, they help us do business, fun, entertainment, everything. So why do we need apps? Now, looking at this from business perspective, we need them because of that. Downloads, billions. We have uh, just a prediction about 195 billion downloads in 2017s. Uh, the accumulative is about 800 billion downloads. Money-wise, we are speaking about, again, $60 billion business. If you are in a business, can you stay out of this? I don't think that we can af afford. And I just got this kind of uh, quote recently about enterprises. So if you are an enterprise, it doesn't matter in what. If you do anything to do with IT, you are losing all your investment in your IT's infrastructure mobile if you don't go with an app. Because that's the way, that's the way. So who are we and what we do? Now, uh, I'm fortunate to be uh, director of uh, Center of Excellence in Mobile Application and Services, CMAS. And we try to help companies in Wales 
to get into the app world. Uh, companies that cannot afford to go to our friends in uh, uh, like Rank Media. And actually, we are partnering with a lot of uh, app developers in Wales in a, a mobile innovation network. So we do refer some uh, jobs to them. But there are companies in the convergence area in Wales, in West Wales, in some areas where, who cannot afford to take the risk to build an app because building an app may cost them 30, 40,000 pounds. And the risk is high because your idea by the time you, you get the app may be done somewhere else. Uh, or the developers do not finish it within the budget, within time, and you lose your money. So for these companies, we try to give them a hand by developing apps for them based on a five million pound uh, European project that uh, I lead. So CMAS has a website. If you are in, uh, within a business in the convergence area of Wales, go to our website to see eligibility uh, criteria, and you may be one of the lucky ones that got an app from us. In the last two years, we have about two years in real business, we have developed lots of apps. I just picked a couple of those to see the range, from electrical engineering to farming, others entertainment, uh, butterflies app, and everything, state agents, many, many more we built for companies. And all these are on the app stores, and companies hopefully make money or have uh, managed to grow because of that. Now, because of the nature of this talk and uh, the title, I tried to look at apps and the, how apps would affect media. Because that was a, uh, the kind of discussion. Actually, I changed the whole presentation this morning to fit into that. But still, at the end, I will catch up with some of the things that we also do. Uh, of course, apps are important for getting media everywhere. So that, that's the key thing. A good example is the BBC iPlayer and Sky Go. Actually, on Saturday, I had to make a choice whether to sit to watch the Lions or to take my son to a birthday party. He's in year one. And obviously, it would have been to stay at home and make the child cry to death. But with that, <laughs> uh, Lions, you know, it's not, not every day. But what, what, happened, what happened is that I didn't have to make the choice because I took my iPad with me. And while he was playing with the other kids, I was watching the lens. So that was a, a kind of app that helps the media and helps the users of the media. But there are other aspects. For example, even if I am at home, how many of us sitting watching the TV would have an iPad or tablet or a phone in our hand? And that can bring a new uh, kind of business to the media, what we call second screen or third screen. Not only reading emails while watching, but using this to interact with what we are watching. And we, in, in my center, we developed a, an app that allows you to interact with who wants to be a millionaire. You can get the questions just on time on your app, and you can answer them. The timing is perfect. Of course, you can't win a, win a million, but at least you know how good you are, and you can get par be part of the game. And of course, there are many others. You interact with a game which runs by others as well through an app. So this phenomenon about second screen or third screen, not just as a screen to read the email, which is disconnected from what's going on the TV, but to be part of it as well. Apps also can go further uh, to become our source of media. If we look at Twitter, or just I, I read, I never get news from anywhere now except from Twitter, because I just read breaking news from BBC, breaking, or from other places. The other day, I was talking uh, on an <clears throat> event. I went home to get a call from Jordan, say, well done, we saw you. <laughs> How? Because somebody took a photo, put it on Facebook. In Jordan, they got the news before my wife. So it's, it's amazing. So the, the news distribution is, is, is changing as well through apps. Now, another aspect is uh, content generated by users. Also, this was a platform we built in uh, our labs. 
we call it media share, but because we didn't trademark the media share, now there is a media share product owned by others under the same name. But uh, that was just a, a, a project we built, allows you to generate content and in, as a channel on your TV at home, you can switch to this channel to see your kids on the seaside doing some films, transmitting to the, your whole channel at home. So the app now becomes part of not only receiving, but generating content to this whole setup. Of course, also apps can help the uh, traditional media. We have, an, have a good example from Welsh medium Galoog. I'm sure many of you know about Galoog, which is a, a Welsh medium uh, newspaper and website. And they thought they want to improve their readership. And we created in CMAS an app for them, which is a game that helps small children to learn Welsh. And this app is supporting this because pe people get this from this media. They get connected to it loyalty, and then you get more readers to the newspaper. So this in this way, it's indirect, basically. And come to games. Of course, Anton mentioned games. Also, games can become a vehicle for distributing information and some maybe advertisement, other kind of media. So apps, we should not look at them, at them as separate world you say that the app world, do we need them? They are part of everything we do, whether it's media or business or anything. The examples I tried to show today is just about apps inter integrated into different types of media. Now, the title of my presentation was about the smarter app. And I, said, I thought, before I finish here, I'm not just talking about things that others do, but about our vision about a smarter app. The apps will not only stay at this level. The app world goes now through a, a, re, a time, a period, similar to the web sites in the 90s. Yes, we do website for everything. Most of the websites are just replicating paperwork. Now apps are replicating websites a little bit more, but we think that apps should go further than that. And in my research center, we try to look at defining in one way what should be a smarter app. And uh, we just said, it cannot be just like when we call a phone. When these phones came, we call them smartphones. And the only reason why we call them smartphones is because they have touch screen, which has nothing to do with being smart. It's just a name. So it cannot be just about the touch screen or being faster or bigger or whatever. It, an app can be smarter, maybe with things that not, not are part of the app itself. It's about capability. And I tried to draw an analogy here about smarter. A person who is sort of smart when they can process information quickly, clever, think it quickly, can memorize a lot of things. But what stops the human from being a superhuman, basically, is our capability of sensing because it's limited. Unfortunately, we have five senses only. They are mainly limited by locality. So we can only sense things that are around us. And also our action is also limited. We have hands, legs. We can do a lot of things with them. But unfortunately, that's also limited locally. So these are two problems that human face that apps can help with. So our vision about the smart apps is our apps that extends the human capabilities with the things that we are not good at. So not, we don't want apps to take decisions because we are good at taking, making decisions. Sometimes irrational, sometimes stupid decisions, but we are capable of making decisions. What we need is something in our hand, wherever we are, that's aware of uh, the context we are in, our location, knows about other friends and others around us with the presence, like Facebook, who is busy, who is not busy, but allows us also to sense remotely, to know what's happening in my home, the temperature in my home. I can see even things that are far away 
on the street, on the motorway before I leave, I can sense the, the, <laughs> the atmosphere, the winds, everything, anywhere. So my sensing capability extends unlimited, but also my capability of acting is unlimited. I can switch on and off my heating at home from my app. I can even open doors for somebody who is coming to my house, but just touching a, a button and the door uh, gate will open for them. Or I can change channel on the television for my son who's sitting there wanting to someone to change their TV channel, and I can change the channel from my app wherever I want. So with an app like this, the person becomes smarter and more capable. So this is what we're working on. We have an app like this that does that, and we hope that it becomes a trend, not only just one-off. Thank you very much. Um, Minute is all I'm done at Gronva. Um, so Gwyn Roberts is now going to just mention a little bit about money that's available. That's something we're all interested in. Hello, Pranda Tehar Hill. Um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Gwyn Roberts. I'm a MD of a company called Terramar Networks that offers um, asset tracking, fleet management services to business customers around the world. Um, but I'm also a member of the uh, creative industries sector panel um, have been for the last sort of three and a half years since the panel was set up and it's really um, in that sort of with that hat on that I've been uh, asked to come here um, to partly to support this event on behalf of the Welsh Government but also to make sure that there's a broad understanding out there um, of what the uh, economic support strategy is from from the government. Um, there has been there had been a perception prior to the panel's inception that uh, there was a lot of emphasis in terms of business support going to uh, film uh, and TV production, and that the newer digital media and software sector generally, which is also part of creative industries, had been a little bit neglected. Um, and that's what led to the establishment of a pilot for the DDF, the Digital Development Fund, um, about 18 months ago, I think. Um, that pilot's been very successful, and it's been decided to extend that. Uh, there's about a million pounds that's been offered to around 30 projects so far. Um, and so uh, there is money there available right up to 2016 uh, for people who have commercial projects for which they uh, would like some sort of funding assistance. Uh, it is a commercial fund and it is supposed to support the general economic um, strategy objectives of employment growth, um, particularly in the uh, knowledge industries, uh, export-led growth as well. Um, so, in other words, to develop some capacity and develop some success in the um, digital industries generally. Um, but uh, along with the S4C fund that was launched um, recently as well, it means there's uh, quite a lot of support available to good projects here in Wales. And uh, I think both of those funds, which also work together, um, would like to see applications from, from good projects. So I'd like to encourage you all to do that. Thanks. <laughs> Um, the S4C fund and the, and the digital fund, we do meet up regularly because one of the good things that's coming about now is the, is the conversations going on uh, between different sorts of uh, organisations like S4C, BBC, Welsh Government to actually look at projects that are going. So if you do go to one place, if it doesn't fit there, then obviously we can obviously direct you in different directions as well. So I think that's important. Right, so we're going to need to give a couple of questions. What's the question? Are you well? It's all of It's very Eurovision, this. is quite exciting, isn't it? <laughs> it's a nice shot of me up there at the moment. <laughs> Steve Dimmick. Right. If not targeted at making money, why not create a better performing mobile website instead of an, of an app? But I think that's interesting. I think there is a progression now towards uh, hybrid apps of using um, responsive websites, wrapping them within apps. What are your thoughts about that, Anton? Uh, oh, the question's gone. Uh, I'll have to remember it. I, I think... Um, it's back. Yeah, oh, there you go. Thank you. Uh, I, we spend a lot of our time recommending people get a, a decent mobile website, to be honest with you, uh, because the reality is that that is the case. You know, uh, apps, I think there's, there's a huge, uh, a 
you know, it's, it's kind of every second word people sort of talking about it, but uh, the reality is that uh, it's for specific purposes. Um, and you find, you know, we find a lot of people coming to us saying, you know, I'd like an app, it's got to be our website as an app. And you just kind of think, well, that's, that's just, <laughs> just, just create a mobile website then. Um, so I think uh, what you do get in an app is something that's very focused, very, very uh, performant. Uh, you can tap into things uh, within the device that uh, perhaps you can't uh, with a website. Uh, and that just gives you opportunities. Uh, the sort of user experience, I think, uh, is just that little percentage uh, uh, nicer. Do, do you think of you know, emerging technologies like HTML5, which is making sort of that experience on mobile devices better? Is, are there advances there, you're thinking, that maybe, because there is a trend, some people saying that we're going away from apps to sort of uh, responsive design? Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, I think one of the, I mean, it would be great, wouldn't it, if there was just one platform uh, that we had to, uh, you know, sort of one, one technology that we could do everything with. Uh, I think the reality is, uh, certainly in the short medium, maybe uh, the, the biggest barrier to that is the platforms themselves, you know. So you've got these monoliths in, in the form of uh, Apple, Google, mm -hmm. uh, Microsoft, and <laughs> formerly uh, Blackberry. Um, Who? Rest, rest in peace. Uh, <laughs> uh, that wasn't a political statement, but um, uh, sorry to everyone who's got Blackberry. But yeah, I, th I think those are the kind of the gatekeepers of what, the way that we uh, sort of obtain our apps um, at the moment um, and uh, aspects of how we actually pay for apps. Developers want to get paid for the work that they do, so you need something really, really easy uh, to actually take that, Khalid, take that money. What do you? I think there is a place for both. Um, yeah, a lot of apps can be done as, as just a website or an interactive website, but um, I think the secret the last slide I showed, there are some situations, some, some apps that need a lot of interaction with the phone capability that you cannot uh, achieve easily with any, even HTML5 or anything. Uh, yeah, a lot of apps that we can see now can be done just on a, web a website. But there will be always a, a place for native apps. But I think what you say, it's about platforms, interesting, because S4C, I think we were guilty uh, in the past of just going for the iOS market and not the Android. And I think with the era of that that we developed, you showed that there was a huge market and demand for Android, especially with the younger younger audience. Yeah. Um, but it is, you know, it's difficult with BlackBerry Windows, you know, it's a different platform because people still want those. Yeah, the, 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 the truth is that people who read history, they know everybody thought about uh, one platform at the time of PC. Yeah. And everybody was betting that this Microsoft will be or Apple, they all survive. Mm -hmm. And as a developer, you will need to be capable of doing something specific for each of okay. them. They will not die. Was there any question on that for a while? Oh, yes. We have another question. Phil Stead, who's actually in the room, which is quite nice. Uh, <laughs> oh, there we are. So Phil Stead has asked the question, <laughs> reading my mind. <laughs> We're actually sort of oh, reading through that. So there we are. So, any question there? Can I start with any questions in the room? Hamish. Hey, so, do you want to introduce yourself, Hamish? Hey, Hamish, hey, 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 Fife from University of South Wales. I'm just wondering whether Gwyn has an active definition of the creative industries and the knowledge industries and so on for your work in the in the in the sector panel, because that would affect a lot of what we do. I think. It's a very good question. Yeah, um, oh God. <laughs> quite, quite early on, the decision was made to align the sector definition with the, the definitions used by DCMS in order to be able to compare Wales', Wales performance with the rest of the UK. Um, so there were defined subsectors, which I won't list, but you know things like antiques and craft, and uh, as well as TV and film and uh, software, uh, digital media. Um, so it's based on those definitions on the SIC codes underlying them. Uh, there is some move going on at the moment to change those, um, to realign actually more of software into creative industries. But um, as I say, it has been a policy, at least up to date, to align ourselves with what is being done elsewhere, not just invent our own. Lovely. So I'm we've got time for another quick question, if anybody's burning. 
I shouldn't quit. I'll, I'll just make one little observation about the question about mobile websites or, or apps. I think one of the interesting things that we're going to be seeing quite soon is um, more use of uh, both GPS and NFC um, as it comes out into phones, which creates the opportunity to have much more personalized, event-driven, and transactional um, uh, things going on in the smartphone, uh, which clearly is going to take things beyond what a mobile website can do. Because I think it's quite exciting because one of the limitations has always been with apps is um, sort of signals and everything within Wales, and Wales has always got the problem. And, and we, we look at GPS, you think of it as an old technology, but it's actually opening up sort of exciting opportunities to develop new new products now. Um, okay. uh, just uh, another note about this. We try now to judge the future of apps based on the apps that we know now. And my view is that we are going through the process of now mainly converting our websites to apps because that's the immediate need. Uh, in a certain period of time, apps will start to become more sophisticated than that and our needs and the way we think about apps will change. So I think apps will continue to be and will be more sophisticated. And of course, the HTML5 will try to catch up, but apps will be more, more relevant, I think. And Anton, have you got a thought you would like to leave us with as we close this session? I'll put you <laughs> on the spot now. I was just going to comment on the connectivity issue in Wales, because obviously that for uh, tourism apps, uh, you know, often you need to have that kind of connectivity to provide uh, up-to-date content. I think that is uh, changing, particularly with uh, rollout 4G, which is going to make life a little bit easier. So I think there's a lot of exciting stuff on the way. Lovely. Thank you very much to the panel. And thank you to Hugh as well. Thank you very much. Uh, now we're going to uh, move into our next session where uh, we're going to be looking at developing a digital public space. Uh, and interestingly, some of what we will be hearing about now kind of feeds back into some of our discussions this morning, partly because of the person who's chairing this. Ian, would you like to come up with your guests? And while you do, I'll make you blush a wee, wee bit. Ian Tweedell is Head of Interactive and Learning uh, at BBC. And uh, we were hearing earlier about the interactive uh, nature of programmes like, for instance, uh, Doctor Who and Sherlock. Ian's been involved in that. Ian's, we've also heard um, discussion of connective studios. Well, Ian's been involved in that as well. So um, who better than to lead this next uh, discussion section, developing a digital public space? Ian, would you like to welcome your guest? Yeah, sure. OK. It's uh, jacket's off time, so uh, <laughs> yeah, OK. So let me introduce Jake Berger. Um, Jake is in charge of a whole lot of things, including um, you've been doing the space project um, and also has been uh, leading on the technical development of something called the Research and Education Space Project, which we'll be finding out a lot more about later. Um, and also, can I introduce Lorna, Lorna Hughes, who's um, Chair of Digital Collections at the National Library of Wales in Aberystwyth. So um, I think that is a unique position in the UK yes. as well. So. This session is actually a little bit different. What we're trying to do in this session is to really identify where there are some opportunities that Wales might take a bit of a lead in. Um, and we think that there are some very interesting developments around, you could call it archive development, but actually I prefer to call it something called the digital public space. Um, and we're going to talk about that and find out a little bit more about what the digital public space is. So rather than me blather on, if I hand over to Jake... I'll blather on. He'll blather on, <laughs> yeah. Thank you for having me. Um, <coughs> due to a slight technical issue, I'm um, having to use two laptops at the same time. <laughs> so it's kind of a bit prog rock, but hopefully it will work. Bear with me just a moment. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about digital public space. Um, I'll try to explain what it is, why it matters, how it could work, and ultimately what you can do to help make it happen. So I thought I'd start with, with the big picture and some, some 
lofty words, but um, don't worry, the, the rest of the presentation isn't quite as lofty as this. But these are the, this is what the BBC uh, are here to do as set out in the Royal Charter and Agreement. And they, they ultimately form the, the constitutional basis for the BBC as presented to Parliament. But things have changed somewhat over the 90 years or so that the BBC has been in existence and never so much as in the last 20 years. So, but I think the BBC's roots in engineering and our, our role in the kind of coming together of, of technology and creativity actually put us in a very good position to be able to try and keep abreast of these changes and to help define what happens next in this realm. But first, just a little bit about me uh, and my team. Um, I'm from Archive Development and the BBC, and we're, we're the bit of the BBC that kind of wonders about what we could do with all of the stuff that we've gathered over the last 20 years, 90 years, um, rather than just make more television, radio, and online content. So what have we got? Well, we've got a hell of a lot, but actually, it, you, they don't, our archives don't contain what most people think or sometimes hope. In the early days, we couldn't actually record programs, so they were just there, experienced, gone. Sometimes we didn't imagine that anyone would actually want to watch what we had made again, so we just got rid of it, even if we could record it. Um, and for quite a while, uh, the tape media was much more valuable, or seen as much more valuable, than the content on it. You know, in the early days of tape recording, it would have been the equivalent of something like sixty to seventy thousand pounds for an hour-long storage cassette, and the BBC, understandably at the time, didn't feel that that was uh, it was that you had to reuse it basically. So we did used to chuck stuff away. Um, that's the old archive centre in the background, and yes, that is a skip full of tapes. Uh, I don't think there are any Doctor Who's in there, but uh, fingers crossed. But I think we've we've learnt from those mistakes. That's good. But we do have a hell of a lot of material. And it's worth saying that our, our archive is an actual archive, not a library, in the sense that the material we have is unique. It's not held by anybody else. And I'd argue that it is um, of immense value. Ultimately, because it has been capturing culture, history, society, ideas, memories, Britain's view of itself in the world since 1922. So within that, there's something of value. For people who like lists, um, there's a list. Um, <laughs> there's a, a lot of stuff now that's probably actually a little bit out of little bit out of date, but it's it's kind of only going up. I tried to ask some of the engineering team how many bits of data we had, and they just fobbed me off with trillions. But um, there you go. But amongst these mountains of stuff, there, there are, you know, frankly, lots of things that um, are of very little interest to anybody. Um, but there are some items that are of value to nearly all of us, and there are others that I think are priceless to, to just a few individuals. So perhaps it's the footage from when the people from the BBC came to your school, or a documentary that featured your town or village, or um, a drama with your when your grandmother was an actress or a film about your favourite steam engine or the technical specification of a vintage valve. You know, people have, people's boats get floated by different things. Um, but so I think sometimes small clusters of, of pixels can have an, an immense amount of personal value and it's kind of matching the people to those pixel clusters that, that, that is the challenge. We do have a lot of pixels. Again, I asked the engineers and they told me we had 91 quadrillion, give or take a few quadrillion. Um, but so when you start to think about the archive in, in atomic terms rather than in terms of whole programs, now that could be that it's just you know half of that program, it could be that it's a five minute sequence, it could be uh, a couple of frames as a camera pans around a, you know, a football or a rugby um, you know, stadium. Um, but by connecting those atoms to the individuals who, who care about them, we can deliver value to the people who funded those atoms in the first place, the license fee payers. So returning back to the big picture away from the atoms, um, I've tried to summarize our mission in this sentence. I, I won't read it out, because I'm sure you can all read. Uh, 
So I'm sure you're all thinking, what does he mean by travel across realms? Well, if the BBC and other institutions can open up their material in a connected manner and set, set, set it out and make it available in a way that people can have kind of horizontal journeys from one bit of archive to another, then you can, again, I won't read it out, but you can start to create these sort of user journeys. Um, and to me, the critical bit is if, if at each stage along the way, the user can add their own thoughts and insight and experience and response to the things that they're finding. And if those thoughts then stick to the individual pieces, then you're slowly building up the sort of sum of human knowledge and teaching the, the archives things about their material that they didn't know themselves. So um, we've been thinking about this for, for a year or so, and we, so we then sort of set our challenge, set ourselves the, the question of well, what is the most that we could do with our archive? Not what's the least we could get away with, but what is literally the, 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 the greatest thing we could possibly do? Um, and we spoke to lots of other um, institutions and organisations as well. We call them the, the memory sector, museums, libraries, archives, galleries, collections, etc. Um, we got loads of different answers, uh, not surprisingly. Um, and we figured that rather than pick a couple, we would try to create a kind of an ecosystem that would make all of the ideas possible. Um, turns out that probably wasn't the easy choice. Um, there are significant challenges, digitization, tiny proportion of archive and you know memory sector holdings are actually digitized and the cost of digitizing it is one thing the fact that the the, the media actually rots um, even when it's digitized you get kind of bit rot so you have to keep transferring between different formats and making sure that the disks are refreshed every now and then um, so the, the digitization itself is is, is challenging um, access for the BBC universality is key you know if you pay the license fee um, you get the BBC. You can't buy a better BBC. Everybody needs to have access. Everybody needs to have an, an equivalent level of access. In an internet age, that's very different. When you've got, in the old days, a television set and an antenna, and in between that, there was, you know, there was just air. Now you've got ISPs. You've got you know, broadband providers. You've got people manufacturing devices. A whole load of people along the way who can potentially slow down or change or route the traffic or shape it in a different way. Uh, Rights, as you see, I've put it up there three times because it's very difficult. Um, enabling people to, to, to contribute and to share. The notions of identity and, and privacy. Now, that's not just about not telling other people what individuals are doing, but it's about making sure that when we're trying to capture people's insight and experience around bits of archive, um, that it can have a kind of a, a sort of personal provenance. So you know that individual or you know, persona X was the person who said Y about Z. And that maybe that person is happy for that piece of information to be shared at that time, or it may be that they want to remain anonymous for X amount of you know, years, uh, but then let their secrets out when they die. You never know. Um, and yeah, so if you can, the provenance and persistence, I'll, I'll come onto that shortly. Um, but so putting aside the tricky stuff, and for the sake of an easy life, we settled upon the following specific description of our vision and I will read this one out though probably not in one breath so imagine much of the UK's publicly held cultural and heritage media assets and data could be found in a unified online space connected together searchable open accessible visible and usable in a way that allows individuals institutions and machines to add additional material and additional meaning and context to each other's media indexed and tagged to the highest level of detail so that is ultimately what we are describing with a digital public space. Um, I'm convinced that if we can make it happen, it will be one of the most significant things that the BBC has ever done and will be of great value to, uh, to others. In case any of you are thinking that's all very well, but what's the point? Um, I will try and describe some of the scenarios. So with properly described linked open semantic data, you can ask questions of a system that are very difficult for a current system to answer. Um, you know, you can try asking Google these questions and see what comes up. So here are a few example questions.
It's not actually my grandmother. I hope it's none of yours. This one's a bit niche, but it kind of illustrates the point. Um, now, I'd argue that if, if, if we trust the public to access our archives um, and to add to them, extend them, amplify them, who knows what will happen, but I'm convinced that people will do it and they'll do it well. Um, you know, if just look at what Wikipedia did by providing a platform and trust, and then five years later we have you know, an immensely valuable resource. Um, I'll very quickly talk about a few of the kind of founding pillars and then I will um, shut up. So uh, permanence, well, here we go. Um, anything that goes into a digital public space should stay there forever and at the same location. So once you know it's there, you know it's always going to be there. Everything should be accompanied by as much information as possible. Um, and this information would be useful to both humans and machines. Um, this, for the machine side of it, it means that the data needs to be semantic data, so readable according to the kind of computer equivalent of grammatical rules and hierarchies of meaning. It's something that enables um, the, the, the content to be understood rather than just linked to. Um, finding out about something should be free to everyone forever, even though sometimes the media itself may be chargeable to use. The underlying technology needs to be built on open standards in order for it to be extendable and sustainable. Um, should be open source wherever we can. Um, we should also never ask for more information from an individual or an institution that, than, is, than is necessary and useful. We're not gathering data for the sake of gathering data, we're gathering it if, if, if there is a, a purpose to doing so. And finally, I think that yeah, the principle of universality needs to be retained. So to paraphrase Tim Berners-Lee, this, this should be for everybody. And we mean that sort of regardless of income, status, ability, and location. So how can we make this happen? Well, starting with the material that we hold on behalf of the public, digitize it, classify it in a semantic web-friendly manner, publish it accompanied by linked open data, listen to what people tell you about it, and who knows what will happen. Thank you. Okay, thanks Jake. I'll ask Lorna to come over, and whilst, we're, whilst she's setting up, one of the things um, I just wanted to flag up is how people might use this. It, it sounds a bit sort of out there, but actually, just over there, as well is a session that uh, is happening right now with uh, schools and um, digital leaders from something called the Hub Project, which is something the Welsh Government is doing with schools. And what we're talking to them about as well is to look at how um, we ask them what sorts of things, what sort of content you really want and what sort of things you need to do. And what teachers, if there are any teachers in the audience, then you'll, you'll recognise this. But but certainly what, one of the things that happens quite often before you're doing a, a lesson, um, you're actually required to sort of get some materials together. So people Google it, and they get maybe several hundred videos of American <coughs> content that might be a bit related to the sort of thing you're looking for. But just imagine if you had all this BBC stuff, SLC stuff, all these other sorts of archives available from different organizations, that's got British content that actually is very relevant and you can find it and clip it up in the right way, it became immediately apparent just how valuable this sort of content could be. So I think that those, those teachers were sort of saying, yes, we really want this sort of stuff. So having this unique record of, of British culture, Welsh culture within, within the 20th century, early 21st century is of great value. What we want to do is to figure out how people might want to use it. So I think we're going to come on to that a little bit later when we do a bit of a connected studio taster as well. But over to Lorna, if you're ready, and we'll find out a little bit more about what other organisations outside the BBC are doing in this space as well. Right. Thanks very much, Ian, and thanks uh, to the organisers for inviting me and uh, letting me come and talk a little bit about some of the things we're doing at the National Library of Wales, which relate to the discussions today. 
Um, I'm not sure. Ah, yes, my slides magically appear. It's always so reassuring when that happens. Um, so um, I'm based at the National Library of Wales in Aberystwyth, where we've got a research program in digital collections, which I've been leading for the last couple of years. And um, what I want to talk about is the um, what I feel, my perspective, is what's at the heart of the digital public space, which is content, um, cultural heritage content, documentary archives, documentary cultural heritage material, which has been made available in digital form through a number of uh, initiatives over the last 20 odd years, and um, which is available and accessible for repurposing um, for all kinds of, uh, all kinds of objectives and reasons. Um, the National Library of Wales has been contributing to the, uh, the public space uh, for pretty much as long as it's existed. Um, the organization has never really had the mindset of being a, a library where you come along with your library ticket and, and that's it. Um, the content that's been held at the National Library has been made available to the public in a variety of forms using a variety of technologies pretty much since the establishment of the library. In the 1920s, the library acquired a photostatic machine, which was terribly exciting. And um, you see here an example of uh, an, early, an early plug for a, a public, uh, publicly accessible content area. Um, the library made um, photostats of its manuscripts accessible for schools and for educational purposes and for researchers to use remotely. And uh, there's some lovely correspondence in the library's collection of photostats of manuscripts being sent out to researchers in the United States to do some Chaucer studies. So we've always had this mentality of taking our content out um, to our public, and our public is international, our public is uh, multidisciplinary. Um, with the advent of digital technologies, obviously, we've become a little bit more efficient than you know, posting out photostats to Chicago uh, historians. And uh, we've been actively digitizing our content over the last 20 years under a, a very large scale mass digitization program read by the li led by the library. Um, and the, the underlying ethos of this digitization program is to create access globally to Welsh and Celtic um, documentary heritage um, that can be used for all kinds of purposes. Um, primarily, we hope that it's used for research and teaching and public, uh, public engagement, um, but it's also used for enjoyment. It's used by family historians around the world. Um, it's used in media productions. It's used by people who uh, enjoy researching and finding out about their culture. It's also used um, for supporting tourism and, um, and other things that, that, that bring people to the content. Um, so we've very much been, uh, been looking at the, the engagement with this kind of digital material as a transformative way of encountering documentary cultural heritage. Somebody mentioned the word disruption earlier today, which is one of my favorite ways of thinking about engaging with digital content. It's a disruption in the continuum of standard approaches, traditional approaches to research or education or public engagement. Um, it gives us the opportunity to engage with people in different ways. Um, the key underlying principle um, of this uh, mass digitization program has been making our content freely accessible. Um, we don't charge for any of our content um, and it is all downloadable, accessible, and much of it is also harvestable. It's uh, accessible through the open archives um, protocols. So it's available for harvesting for lots of different purposes and through different aggregators. The reason that it's freely accessible is not just political, it's because it's been a condition of our funding for digitization. We've received funding from research councils like the Arts and Humanities Research Council, um, JISC in the UK, and funding from the EU, and of course, core funding from the Welsh Government, which um, enabled us to start the digitization program. So we've built this cohesive national collection, a sort of canon, as it were, of Welsh um, cultural heritage material, which is accessible. 
And um, again, from the very early stages of building this digitization program, we've leveraged the, the underlying technical infrastructure within Wales. Um, as you're aware, Wales is a, a country with some geographic, linguistic different distinctions between different parts of the countries. It's also an area of, um, as, I, as I believe an advertising campaign run about 10 years ago said, an area of outstandingly bad mobile phone reception. So um, we've always had to think about getting our content out to the public using technologies using um, re, uh, using um, digital infrastructures. And um, in Wales, we've been very fortunate, uh, primarily through Kamal, the Welsh Government division that take, uh, deals with museums, libraries and archives and cultural heritage. There's been a lot of investment in this underlying technical infrastructure and it's meant that we've been able to make library resources, ebooks, library catalogues, integrated collections freely accessible to people in Wales. Um, so we've also had um, a very good interlinked uh, network of university repositories in Wales, the Welsh Repository Network, which again networks cultural heritage collections around Wales. So the library's been in a position to leverage this architecture and infrastructure um, and as Andrew Green, the former librarian, described it, it's really a rethink um, of what it means to belong to a library. You don't belong to an, a library because you come to the library. You belong to the library because you use the content no matter where in the world you are. Um, so I just want to zip through a, a few of these collections just to give you a sense of the kind of material that has been created for um, all of these audiences. One of the, one of the earlier um, projects that we developed is the, uh, the Welsh Journals Online, which um, it, it sort of looks a little retro, um, but it does what it says on the tin. It enables you to search and browse all of the Welsh journals that are uh, available. Um, and it's a very useful resource for research and teaching. Um, and it really does start to engage this, this quote from Melissa Terrace at UCL, the idea of transformation of our collections by, by taking a collection and digitizing it and enabling people to see the content next to other related content and presenting it for different uses, we really are transforming our own, our audiences and also the content. We recently launched um, just this year um, our most, um, uh, possibly our largest collection of content, which is the Welsh newspapers online. And we're really, really proud of this. Um, this has been funded by the EU and the Welsh government. And it will be at least a million pages of Welsh newspapers from the 19th century. And actually the newspapers will go up to about 1918 because we've been able to include newspapers from the World War I period, um, completely freely accessible. And this is exciting, not just because it's a big chunk of digital stuff. It's enabling people to really do new things. You can't just browse a million pages of newspaper. You have to visualize it, spatialize it. So it's all there ready to be reused and redeveloped into something um, that something in, um, in consulta consultation and collaboration with other people putting content in the digital public space. Um, another project that we're working on at the moment, which will be launched uh, in November, uh, is funded by JISC and the library and is uh, the Welsh experience of World War One. We're digitizing um, about 190,000 pages of archives, not just from the library, um, but from libraries and special collections around Wales that relate to um, the Welsh experience of the war. It's not a military history, it's a social, economic, literary, linguistic, artistic history of the impact of the war on Wales at a very divisive time in its history. Um, so it's going to be very, very important for education and research. Um, but what's also nice about this project is because the content comes from lots of different archives and special collections, we're actually able to virtually reunify um, archival collections that haven't been brought together since they were created. Um, the other thing that we're experimenting along with everybody else is, of course, crowdsourcing, which is uh, community-generated content. Um, the idea of sourcing tasks to a wider audience 
um, and getting tasks that would pre previously be performed by individual experts, by groups from the community. Um, crowdsourcing is the sort of standard term for it, but I, d I prefer the term citizen science because I think it, is a, a, it expresses more of the engagement. Um, and the project that we'll be launching very soon is um, Wales 1900, which is uh, a place name generator. Um, Welsh place names are uh, varied and complex, um, and if we can produce a geo-referenced gazetteer of place names, it will able, enable us to digitally unlock a lot of our content and enable people to search and browse by, by location. Um, so again, it's, it's an opportunity to engage and bring people together. Um, so again, at the, at the heart of all of this is, is freely accessible digital content that tells a national story. It's a canon, a distinctive collection of accessible material um, available to lots of different audiences and communities. Um, and I think it's important too to state that through various partnerships, this content is exposed through things like Europeana, it's available to European audiences, and we've also been working with Hub to, um, in, to um, give them content that can be reused for education. And um, again, it will be part of the digital public space as well uh, through the BBC. Um, so the key thing that we've been trying to focus on, and, and again, very strategically, is how do we ensure that we're creating the right content for the use and reuse that is necessary? And also, how do we increase the value of our existing content by making sure it's used by, um, for the best, uh, the best range of people, for the widest possible range of purposes? And I think also it's worth mentioning that this is a focus for knowledge exchange. We're building a vast, uh, a, a great deal of experience about digitization and digital asset management and preservation. So I just want to mention a couple of um, initiatives that have um, that are ongoing at the moment to um, that relate to knowledge exchange. The first is a project called DigiDo, which is based at the library and funded by the European Union. And it's digital content for business. And it's a means of helping uh, businesses in, the, in Wales um, work with our content and, uh, and use it, find it, use it, and repurpose it. And they're um, based at the library. And they run workshops on using and reusing digital content. Um, the other thing that we've become very actively involved in is the question of working with hybrid archives and born digital content. An awful lot of our archives come to us in this kind of form. Um, this is the Breath Goff Performance Archive, or some of it. Um, and you can see videotapes and DVDs and floppy disks and large floppy disks and ancient Macs. That's what we get now when we get somebody's archive. We don't get a bunch of papers. So converting this kind of material to digital and then preserving it and sustaining it over the long term is now a huge part of the library's remit. And um, accordingly, we're in the process of developing a bid to the Heritage Lottery Fund right now to develop a conservation and preservation center for uh, Wales. Um, we've recognized that this is a very common problem. Lots of people who are grappling with digital content are going to face an issue in the long term of how to preserve and sustain it and give access to it. Um, I was very struck by some of the presentations this morning, especially the interactive television programs of how do we actually sustain that as an artifact so that researchers in 20 years can come and get the full experience of not just the program, but the social media add-ons, the Twitter feeds, and all of the material that enhances and enriches that content. It's a huge issue. Um, so we're hoping to um, build a focus of expertise in digital preservation and conservation uh, for Wales, which will be a focus for all of this, um, uh, for this kind of expertise, and also an opportunity for us to provide, not just provide a resource and provide research that other people can benefit from, um, but also to learn from what's happening in the, uh, the other communities, the creative industries and the broadcasters as well. So um, really, we see our role as content provision 
um, research and uh, research and education in all aspects of digital content creation. But primarily, we want people to use the content. It's there. It's free. And um, please make make best use of it. So I'll finish there. Okay, thank you, Jake and Lorna. Um, hopefully you get a flavor of just, we might be on the cusp of something quite interesting and different here. I think someone mentioned digital transformation, and, and I think that that is, is, is a good term. I think if you look at what happened with the iPlayer, um, really transforming the way a lot of us watch TV and, and, and sort of look at TV in an on-demand or even live way on different platforms and so on, I think the potential is there for the digital public space to do similar things of, of reusing content in slightly different ways. So let's throw it open for questions. Um, we've got something up on the on behind me, which is interesting. Good. Okay. Ah, right. Okay. The big R issue. Right. Do you want to shoot some? Anyway. Well, I can do it being made freely available. Okay. So so that's um that's a specific one for. For her, but I've got someone waving at me over That's there. My question. Oh right, okay, brilliant, <laughs> very good. Well, I think for the, the rights issue is is a big issue in all of this, and I think that with with Hub, which is the Welsh government's um, learning platform, the idea of that is that you would actually be signed into Hub so that it would know you were a school and that you have access through something called an Era Plus license, if that means anything to you. Um, to enable you to access this this content freely and do things with it, so so I think rights is key to all of this. But in a con in an environment where you are signed in and behind effectively a, a, a sort of authentication wall, we can get rid of that rights issue, and that's where a really important opportunity lies. So I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, Jake. I mean ultimately, you know, with, with rights, you either need. You, know, you either need the rights, you need the permission, uh, which usually comes uh, at a cost, or you need some kind of collective licensing or blanketing of agreement. For uh, broadcast material that's broadcast for since 1980, well, from 1989 onwards, then if the school uh, is able to pay a kind of £2-ish per year, don't quote me on that number, £2-ish per year per student fee, then you can access anything that has been broadcast free to air in this country, uh, and you can you know you can do a whole load of things with it. Um, those kind of agreements uh, aren't necessarily in existence for other other media types, and they're certainly not in existence for people who aren't formal learners. Um, but I think for there's a substantial amount of stuff that Hub will be able to offer, um, uh, you know, at at, uh, at a, at a not substantial cost at a kind of individual level. Okay, thank you. Any, any more questions? There's one at the back over there. My name is Viv Hollyfield. I'm an incorporated engineer and member of the Institute of Engineering Technology. I was a broadcast engineer, BBC Engineering Division from 1969 until 1995. I'd like to ask the gentleman from the uh, BBC Archive, what system of checking the authenticity of public contribution to your archive? Because the BBC have built up a tradition of trust over many years. Yeah. How are you going to test that the entries and the contributions are true and authentic? Thank you. Uh, well, it's a very, <laughs> it's a very uh, good, good question. Um, I think there's, um, there, there's a, 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 num a number of things. I mean, firstly, uh, you know, the, B the BBC or any kind of you know administrator of a digital public space, if the thing ever comes into being, um, uh, wouldn't be able to go through and check everything that has been said. Wouldn't be able to check that every assertion is is true. Um, I think what we would like to put in place and have been thinking about it is a means of uh, identifying individuals who are perhaps associated with a particular 
professional specialism or institutional field. So if you're logged in with you know, a, a university um, you know, with the university email address, and you're, you, you've been sort of you know, um, authenticated as a subject matter expert, then we would assume that everything that you say is likely to be true, or at least backed up with a certain amount of support. Um, for a lot of the a lot of the, the assertions that people might make, uh, they they would be um, you know unashamedly subjective and related to the individual. And so I think we, we have to be able to allow um, scope for people who just want to say something but aren't trying to be the kind of canonical sort of expert on it. Um, um, well, I mean, that kind of turns into a slightly philosophical question because if, if even within professional and academic specialisms, you don't, you know, you, you probably never get two people agreeing on exactly the same things. I mean, yeah, there is. So, I mean, um, are, are, are we going to build something that says that, you know, this person is, you know, is, is always to be trusted on these subjects, but not on that. Uh, no, we're not. Um, I, I think it's going to be more like the uh, kind of more like the, the, the Wikipedia model, where you uh, kind of assume that things start to converge towards consensus. Okay, got a question over here. Hi, Christina McCauley, BBC Wales. Um, Jake, it seems like a huge, huge project that you've got planned. The BBC hasn't got a very good record at the moment in these big <laughs> digital media projects, as you know. Um, there isn't a sort of more short-term solution of trying to get just the programmes available to the public. I mean, at the moment, we've got seven days and then things disappear. I mean, how far is the BBC managing to move along that journey? Because I would have thought that at least it's a start on the on the way then yeah i mean i i think um i think there's a um there, there's a, a desire within the bbc to extend uh availability uh through um through sort of you know free or commercial means um and you know, I, I'm not I'm not the expert on that so I, I wouldn't want to I wouldn't want to say too much in that area. And I think whilst whilst the the, the the scale of the idea of a digital public space does sound does sound frightening, and it sounds like a massive technological kind of intervention. Actually, at its heart, um, if people such as you do, <laughs> um, um, you know, um, um, digitise and classify material uh, in, in a, a sort of a standardized way, uh, publish it openly on the web using linked open data, the principles around which are, are, are kind of relatively clear, and can describe it in the metadata and the tagging using the kind of you know, an established sort of semantic markup language, um, then if everybody did that, then the digital public space, the, the, the layer that just says, that points at all of the stuff that all the different organizations have, 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 have contributed and says that that, when, you know, that that Dylan Thomas is the same as that Dylan Thomas but different to that one, uh, then when you're doing these kinds of queries, um, it, the, you know, the, 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 it, it would just work. So it, it isn't a massive infrastructure project. It isn't that the, that the BBC would be storing the stuff that other people are holding. It would just be pointing to stuff that other people are holding. So it's, a, it's, it, it's there's some quite, um, it involves a kind of coordination and integration of a number of existing open technologies, but it doesn't require building massive machines and massive networks. Um, so I, you know, I'm, I'm an optimist, but I'm, I'm confident that, that, it's, that it's doable if people uh, adopt the common standards and they, they, they're, I think it's fair to say, they're beginning to emerge across the sector. Okay. Anything you'd like to add to that, Lorna? Because obviously this is not just about the BBC, this yeah. is much yeah. broader. Yeah. Well, that's, I think, one of the, the ways in which the library can partner with creative, sorry, with creators of content in that, you know, we are an archive, we are a library, you know, we do we do uh, use best practice for digitization and description and publishing of data. So, um, you know, we can be a source of 
uh, support on that kind of thing um, because we are in an environment where there, you know it's not just the BBC and the library lots of people are becoming digital publishers at the yeah. moment um, and the as you, you're absolutely right the better these things are described and 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 uh, managed the more likely they are to be discovered and shared um, so yeah. I think there's there's a t an opportunity here for a lot of collaboration yeah and I, I think it's a, the people who, who are, you know are a little bit ahead of the game on this um, because they've, they've been thinking about it for a bit lo for a bit longer than others um, to partner with and support the people who haven't really started thinking about it yet so at the point when some of the smaller collections are, are you know being digitized for the first time, that they're done in a way that's just going to fit in with the rest of the world. Um, it's you know it's at a technical level, it, it isn't it isn't complicated if the right decisions are made early enough in the chain. So it's about laying the foundations yeah. in a way, yeah, and then and then putting things on top. I mean, I, I think there's another opportunity which is for companies who are going to get into this sort of thing. It's what the things are that sit on top of this archive or on top of this digital public space, yeah. that's where a lot of the value also lies and, and that may not be something that the BBC yeah. produces, it could be other people and that's where I think some of the opportunities lie for, for maybe some of the people in this room as well. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, uh, yeah I think it's, 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 it's worth reiterating that the digital public space, you know, it, isn't, it isn't a product, it isn't a kind of Google-like search engine or an application, it's, it's a platform that brings together um, diverse sets of media and data, and presents them through through you know through a set an API or a set of APIs, in a manner that makes it easy for people to build products on top of. Yeah. And yet the BBC doesn't have any desire to build those products. What we want to do, and, you know, and it isn't the BBC leading it. It's the BBC, uh, you know, in a, gen gen a genuine sort of coalition with a lot with the sector, um, just saying in unison. We, we think this is a good idea and we're willing to give it a go. Okay, do we have a final question? Yeah, over here. Uh, Richard, well, uh, <coughs> can you just hold on a second till the mic gets you? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's all right, we're streaming it, so <coughs> you're not that loud. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Richard Wanner, Independent. Um, this might be as meaningless a question as your one about how many pixels do you actually have in your archive. Um, have you actually made an assessment of exactly what the rights would cost you if you had to buy them? Because rights, this rights issue, it always appears to be accentuated. It's obviously important, but it may well be over accentuated if we just took the Google view of the, the digitization process, threw the whole lot up there, and then see who complained. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I mean, it, it's an attractive idea to me, though I suspect there's quite a few lawyers who would be having heart attacks. Um, I mean, you know, I, I, I have no idea how much all the rights would, would cost. I know, I can guess, it would be many magnitudes more than the license fee income. Uh, and also, people don't like selling rights in perpetuity. They like selling them for a period and then you come back and you pay again. It is, you know, it, it, it is, it, it, it's, it's a very substantial challenge. However, the some of the... Um, the, the thoughts that have been emerging from some of the, the reviews about IP and copyright law and the extent to which people should be able to, to, to kind of use sequences for, for kind of review or criticism, uh, perhaps in the way that is a little bit more in place in the United States. Um, so that, 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 that there are things which would make it easier that may happen in the medium term. Uh, but yeah, it, it is it is it is a fundamental challenge. And what what what, what I think the most likely uh, first steps are is um, putting making available through a digital public space the material that the rights owning organisations uh, are happy to make available. Yeah. And I I would kind of rather build something, make as much material as as is easily available available. And then see what happens. Because if we wait for the rights to be resolved, uh, then well, we'll be waiting a long time. Yeah. Well, I think it's interesting what happened with the education recording agency era. Um, in you know, teachers were essentially recording on to VHS off the telly in the eighties. That led to the creation of that organisation to get round that rights issues to develop an opportunity where 
those organizations who own the rights could get some recompense for that. So that's how ERA was established. ERA Plus in a digital environment is taking that into another phone. So I think it's that sort of solution. It's not free access as such, it's with a license to do it. So, um, you know, that, that might be a solution. There might be others as well. But I think in an education context, that could be one that, that could address that issue that you're talking about. Okay, final question or any more? No? Okay, well, I'm conscious we're sort of moving on to the next stage. These two things are connected though. So, um, so what I, I thought we could do, thanks very much, Jake and Lorna. That's very good. Very good. Thank you. We'll give you a minute just to sort of uh, move around and get the next group up. Okay, welcome back. We're nearly ready to go.
Okay, for those of you who are here first thing in the morning, I think that Rodri, Telvan Davis, and, and Lord Patton mentioned something about connected studios. Um, you may have wondered what that is, and now you're going to find out. So, um, what I'm not going to do is blather on again, but I will introduce Robin Cramp, who's the project manager for um, connected studios in the UK as a whole. And we're working very closely with Robin to work out how we establish a connected studio in Wales. And I think Robin's going to give a bit of an overview as to where we are. And then we're going to do a hands-on taster for connected studios, which we'd really like you to get involved in. And you get a feel, a much better feel, for how it's going to work rather than just listening to PowerPoint slides. Over to you, Robin. Thank you. Hi, Wales. <laughs> How are we doing? Yeah, this is a proper hot house of digital I've found out because it is proper warm in here. So I don't know what's been happening all day, but it is hot. Indeed, it is in hot. So uh, just before we get into the taster session, because uh, we're going to have a small break after I've just done this so we can just move the room around because we need lots of space because it's about movement. We're all standing. We're getting involved. Yes, yeah, so we're not sitting down. We're not passive anymore. We're going to get involved. Who's up for getting involved in some stuff? Yes, yes lovely. That's nice. So, um, taster session. Next one, what is Connected Studio? Okay, so to give you the, the outline of what Connected Studio is, um, it's part of research and development. Now, Connected Studio was funded initially for a, a year-long program, which was, uh, which was last year. And essentially, we're working with the, the online uh, product areas of the BBC. So that's the 10 product areas of FM. Um, I will try and remember them all, and I will do it right now. We're going to go for homepage, weather and travel, um, CBBS, CBBC, UX and D, Sport, iPlayer, News, KNL. Is that right? It's about right. Yes, <laughs> got it. Two left. They're, 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 they're joined. KNL's joined. Yeah, yeah. Don't question. Yeah. So uh, the process of Connected Studio basically breaks down into a, in a few stages. So um, essentially, it's a, an innovation brief. So what we've found is the BBC in the past has done some innovation programs where they've done uh, sort of like BBC labs where they've just had a space for innovation. So I just thought, let's do some innovation and then just see what comes out of it with naturally no real sort of understanding about what they're actually putting in. So what we've found is actually if you work with the product teams, um, you can actually sort of devise an innovation brief. So find out the things that are not actually innovating within, within their product roadmaps and actually hone that down. So the innovation brief is essentially um, what that actually does. So the uh, colleagues from marketing and audiences work with the product teams to actually define what that uh, product brief is for the connected studio. And that is essentially published publicly. So that's open to not only uh, internal BBC, but also Indies as well. So um, the, the great thing about Connected Studio is, is when we get to the, the Creative Studio section. So basically that works as a, a one-day creative day. So uh, we bring in people that have, uh, that have signed up for this process. So they come through to Creative Day. So you've got indies working with the BBC. So we do uh, an opportunity where people get their ideas up on an ideas wall. And uh, so people might come with a, a really defined idea and they might be in an indie and working with that idea exclusively all day. So somebody might come with a half-baked idea. Uh, we, we, again, with our teams, we help, help to sort of creatively facilitate getting teams together and that works really well. So you not only got indies working with indies, but also collaborating indies with BBC. So that works extremely well. So in that process of the day, you've got uh, opportunities where we give uh, creative stimulus through... Uh, speakers, we have a speakers corner, so we have lots of insight into the briefs, the product teams are there on hand to be able to sort of give that insight into what the opportunities are for developing on that day. Uh, right through to the point that you've got a slide up there at the moment where we get through to pitching, which is uh, it's a nice thing. So you get normally 30, 35 ideas that get to be pitched in quick succession. So we have normally two hours, you think about it, it's two hours, um, 35 pitches, two minutes, and we fire them through pretty rapidly. And uh, it, it generally works quite well, actually. So people round of applause, they did it at the end. So they go like, yeah, it's all good. So that's the creative studio. So what we do then from that judging point, we have a panel of judges from the product team and they work out what are the best ideas. So um, that then goes through to the build studio stage. Okay, so the build studio is a little bit more intense. It's two days, okay? So we actually pay for people's time to come into this one. 
So the creative day, it's a one day where people can come in and it's all open, people come in and pitch their ideas. But when you get to the build studio, we've shortlisted generally down to 10 ideas. And in that point, we actually pay for people to come and pay their day rate times to come through from that. So we're invest investing time in the people and their ideas. Much more intense to the point that we actually provide technical infrastructure, so servers and access to BBC content to give people um, the tools to be able to create something. And ultimately, at the back of the end of that second day, we actually want to see a tangible demonstration of what people are actually working. And that's what people do. So they actually produce something and demo something live. Um, out the back of that, we get them to pitch again, yeah? But a little bit longer, we give them 10 minutes and Ultimately, we get it down to normally about three or four ideas that then go through to dun, 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 the pilot stage. Okay, so that's where we are at the moment with pilots, um, which essentially um, we have a team of project managers on the BBC side that work um, with us. So we've got 27 pilots. I'll get to those numbers in a moment. Um, so that's the process. That's what we've done so far. So we've done 18 events. Um, right across the UK, so we work with, uh, with Cardiff on the Knowledge and Learning um, Connected Studio a few months back, so we did that as a, a technical feat we did here, we did Salford and we did Glasgow and we did it all live. Do you remember that guys? Yeah, they're nodding at the back, yeah we remember that. It was good though, it all worked, no technology fails at all, so that was really good. So 290 creative pitches came out and uh, 76 proof of concepts uh, and then we're down to 27 pilots. So that's where we are, and we've worked across, these are the pilots spinning through here, and this is my transition that I did on PowerPoint here. I think that deserves a round of applause in itself, I think, yeah? Look at that, amazing, all the way through the product. So 27 pilots, and uh, I just wanna give you a quick demo, actually. So um, if you can switch aside to BBC Now. Look at that, that's working as well. Okay, so because this is being controlled at the back, it's by telepathy, I think. Is that the right word, telepathy? Yeah, okay, so essentially this one here came out of the, um, the homepage connected studio, which was in June last year. So this is actually out, it's live now, as in um, a prototype demo. So you can log into, um, go to the connected studio website, you can see this uh, working. So the, the principle of this being out there is to be able to sort of uh, put the projects out to, to get uh, input and audience reaction to how these things sit. Now, the idea with BBC Now is, is working with BBC content because the BBC publishes thousands of pieces of content daily. And with the existing website, the homepage, you don't actually get a real sense and feel as to how dynamic that content is coming through. So if you see on the right-hand side, you've got this navigation point where you're actually seeing the, the live, as it publishes, that content goes, goes through. Uh, and at the moment, it's working with um, a number of fire hoses of content that's coming through from RSS feeds, uh, Twitter, and also iPlayer content as well. And that's been filtered because there's a number of sort of social platforms that the BBC use. So at the moment, it's, it's in uh, the relatively top tier sort of areas around news uh, and, uh, and other product areas. Um, so as you scroll through, Luke, on his little scrolly thing at the back there, wonderful skills. You can see the, uh, the content as it's, so there's quite a lot of new stuff that's come through there. There's a bit of Radio 1, um, and there's a nice bit of disclosure there. Maybe we should listen to that, I don't know. Um, scroll really quickly back to the top, please, Luke. And then you can see right at the top there, you've got four, um, these are basically trends. So these are the top four trends that are coming through with the content that's being posted. So um, click on, yeah, go on, let's have a look at Brazil. So you can think, okay, what's happening with Brazil? You can drill into that. And then if you can click, um, if you click on one of the stories, you can go directly into that particular story, find out a little bit more about it. So um, if you can find your way back, that'd be amazing. <laughs> Let's check his skills. But it will go back. But um, the product, being out here at the moment for the product team for, within Homepage, this is a great opportunity for them to put stuff live, test it, and actually get some audience uh, input into how they feel about the content, etc. Um, next iteration for this, because it's, it's coming down, it's been you know, perceived uh, and received uh, really well, is to be able to give the audience the opportunity to actually um, drill down themselves, make them a bit more personal. So if you, you want to know a bit more about sports, et cetera, or particular teams, you could sort of like, you could filter that, uh, that uh, tagging system on the right-hand side there. 
So uh, that's just an example of, um, of what came out of a connected studio from a brief that was published, uh, as I say, back in, uh, um, in June. So in, in terms of what's next for connected studio, we're, we're working into a, a two year, well, three years? Three years, three, four. We've gone from one year, we're doing loads of years now because everybody likes connected studio, like, we like a bit of this. So we're going through, we're into year two now. So comedy briefing is on the 2nd of July in London. Uh, and then we've also got the Commonwealth Games with our colleagues up in Glasgow. So the Commonwealth Games one is a, is a full-blown connected studio in the sense that we want to actually, the briefs are out live, and we, we want to actually get some ideas through from anybody from across the UK around those specific briefs. So if you want a bit of that, yeah? <laughs> anybody remembers that? We were over in uh, Salford. We got some hands up in the air. We do like hands up because, it's like I say, it's all about energy. You've got to keep the energy, especially when you're in a hot room like this, you need a bit more of that, yeah? Yeah? Come on, Matt, do it. Yes. <laughs> Indeed. So, yeah, if you want a bit more of that, check us out on Twitter, hashtag Connected Studio, and you can find out more information about Connected Studio in general, those pilots, and uh, anything upcoming. So, uh, that's a little insight into Connected Studio. I think we're going to do a very quick break because we're going to annihilate this room to make it very much more sort of a stand up space. So, don't take this opportunity to go outside and ponder. And walk around. We want you. We want you to embrace and be in here. So, give yourself what? Ten minutes? Do you think? 10, 15 minutes? 10, 15 minutes? Have a quick break. We'll annihilate the room. Come back in. And we'll have some fun. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. So, if people could be back by four o'clock, that would be great. <laughs>